Today in world literature, we turn to African and Arabic prose fiction. Our lecturer, Professor Nikki Stiller, provides studies of the short fiction of Chinua Achebe of Nigeria and Nagwa Mafuts of Egypt. In reviewing the fiction of Achebe, Professor Stiller focuses on civil peace, a story set in the aftermath of the Nigerian Civil War. After Nigeria gained independence in 1960, ethnic rivalries threatened to destroy the country. A bloody civil war ensued, millions of people starved to death from 1967 to 1969. In 1979, after 13 years of military rule, Nigeria's army leaders began to give the government a civilian elected government, but again, the army seized control. At the present writing, an elected government remains a goal, but military rule is the reality. In the story Civil Peace, Achebe depicts the strengths of a family that is symbolic of the strengths of the African continent when faced with adversity. Nagwib Mafuts, Egypt's leading literary figure, is the first Arabic language author to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. He was awarded that prize in 1988. A very prolific author, he is generally thought of as a realist. His most famous work, the Cairo Trilogy, presents a social commentary on the development of modern Egypt. In nearly 40 novels and 12 short story collections, Mafuts has reckoned with the social upheavals of his country. None of my books, he has said, is without a political dimension. In his short story, The Happy Man, we see a microcosm of the modern conditions. A middle-aged journalist wakes up happy and finds this state intolerable. Some tasks are merely difficult, and some are impossible. In this lecture, I'm going to attempt an impossible one, and that is to give an overview of the modern writer's dilemmas in Africa and in the Arabic-speaking lands in 20 minutes. I will then explore two representative works, one from Nigeria and one from Egypt, that embody some of the conflicts and resolutions facing the literate of these nations at the end of this century. Your anthology gives you the details, but what I want to stress about the enormously complex and various canvas that is Africa is that the modern African writers and the Arabic ones uh, have had to establish a genre where one did not exist before, that is, uh, the prose fiction a novel. Every people has a poetic tradition, but in Africa this was in many cases oral, religious, or historical and very much connected to the ethnic group or tribe. And in the Arabic lands, uh, there was a uh, very strong uh, tradition uh, of prose, of, of fiction, but it was not in, in prose for the most part, it was in, in poetry. Uh, today, writers are establishing a very new tradition. It consists of a dialogue with European writers, or perhaps I should call it a dialectic in which the African sensibility meets the European sensibility and produces a third that encompasses both. English as a literary language compounds the question of heritage. Indeed, many of the great African writers employ English since colonial times, a lingua franca in pidgin or European form, between and among tribes. Africa is the home of hundreds of languages. Within Nigeria itself, there are three major tongues, so that even after independence, many Nigerians conducted business, wrote books, and schooled their children in what had been the language of their oppressors. Chinua Shebe deals with this, as well as with the greater cultural conflicts, including the adoption of Christianity and Western values, in many of his works. In No Longer at Ease, for example, which I'm going to discuss shortly, he meets the problem of language head on. His protagonist has returned to Nigeria and is visiting his native village. He says, or he thinks, or the narrator says, four years in England had filled Obi with a longing to be back in a mafia. This feeling was sometimes so strong that he found himself feeling ashamed of studying English for his degree. He spoke Igbo whenever he had the least opportunity of doing so. Nothing gave him greater pleasure than to find another Igbo-speaking student in a London bus. But when he had to speak in English with a Nigerian student from another tribe, he lowered his voice. 
It was humiliating to have to speak to one's countrymen in a foreign language, especially in the presence of the proud owners of that language. They would naturally assume that one had no language of one's own. He wished they were here today to see. Let them come to Amalfia now and listen to the talk of men who made a great art of conversation. Let them come and see men and women and children who knew how to live, whose joy of life had not yet been killed by those who claimed to teach other nations how to live. Granted, this is the third-person limited voice of a character speaking, but Obi, uh, our protagonist, as a character, is musing on the linguistic concerns of an entire continent. There are those who would not consider the English language works of Achebe or Wole Swayenka or the French language works of Leopold Sadar Senghar, African literature at all. Nadine Gordimer and other white Africans, some hold, are beyond the pale. Neither I nor the editors of this anthology happen to think so, for identity is not entirely a question of language, although, of course, it is intimately intertwined with it. Why write in a European language at all? Because the colonial experience brought with it some qualities that the native peoples themselves desire to incorporate, Christianity, modernity, and several hundred years of European literary tradition, which many African and Arabic writers have incorporated adopted and made their own in one or two or three generations. Is a novel an appropriate form for African society? Immensely so, for its ability to address the most complex societal and personal questions in a way that the more traditional poetic genres and prose tales could not. Nowhere is this more evident than in the fiction of Achebe, the long fiction of Achebe. Civil Peace, the short story in your text, is striking, alarming, encouraging, discouraging, and insightful. But a short story can do no more than give us a glimpse of the complexities involved in a life where tribal values are blurred and decisions must be made uh, in one moment that have their roots on another continent and their ending, who knows, in another life. Jonathan Igwebu, I I Iwegbu is in your story, is a plucky, practical man, a comedic fellow. In this brief tale, like Odysseus, he is a survivor. A modern African, he wishes to advance financially, but is wise enough to acknowledge that the evils of peace, theft, unemployment, are nothing compared to the evils of war. He has perspective, the soul of humor, and whatever real violence appears, the thieves do threaten to kill him the night before, is washed away by the sunny light of the business-as-usual morning. No Longer at Ease is not a sunny book. This full-length work, set in the 50s, just before Nigeria's independence, starts in a courtroom and ends in a courtroom. Achebe, whose most famous work, Things Fall Apart, Professor Elliott talks about in this course, alluded to Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, and chronicled the disintegration of tribal society. Achebe here alludes to T.S. Eliot's The Journey of the Magi and chronicles the disintegration of one individual torn by conflicting allegiances. Our hero, or protagonist, I should say, Obi Okonko, is a bright and feeling fellow. And Ibo, whose father is a Christian catechist, Obi has grown up in an atmosphere that seems for the most part who have achieved a perfect equilibrium. Believers in the old gods and the new live side by side in harmony. The village provides support, financial and intellectual, for the young man's foray into the white man's world of the senior civil service. Ibo's mother tells him folk tales on the sly, but his father's Christianity is not seen as oppressive. On the contrary, Obi's father broke with his own father over a ritual killing of a boy uh, who called the, the older man father. But when Obi returns from university in England, he is faced with a great deal of financial pressure, responsibilities to repay the loan given by his tribe, financial obligations to his parents, and the practice of widespread corruption by an older generation of African civil servants. Moreover, besides his debts, figuratively speaking, to the tribal society from which he springs, he has fallen in love with a charming, intelligent young woman named Clara. Clara, however, happens to be Usu, untouchable, victim of a generations-old curse on her family. Obi's family, 
despite their sincere Christian faith, cannot abandon this residual piece of barbarism. Obi does not have the inner strength to resist. He has no one to turn to or to back him up. And the pressure of his friends, his parents, and his tribe is just too much for him. His mother even says that she will kill herself if, uh, if he marries the girl, or that, that she will die from her illness uh, if he marries the girl. In the end, he succumbs to taking a bribe and to renouncing his intention of marrying Clara. He loses both her love and their child, for she has an abortion. Thus, this young man of promise, a whole generation, who cannot withstand the temptation of fulfilling his obligations and who cannot stomach his mother's curse, as which of us could, is truly lost. And uh, this is a tragic and very African work, but in its delineation of the loss of self under societal pressure, it reveals a relevant and intensely modern theme. The Arab world has had a great tradition of fiction since the 11th century at the very least, and in fact contributed not, contributed not only a thousand and one nights, but many, many major stories to medieval Europe. The novel, however, has been a 20th century development in the Arab world, according to Roger Allen in the Arabic novel. And the name of Nagib Mahfouz, in Allen's words, personifies the Arabic novel's achievement of genuine maturity. His lexicon, Allen goes on to say, is not particularly large, and the style reflects the regularity of the civil servant he was, as well as the craftsman who writes, as Mahfouz has done for decades daily, in a time-honored manner, just as he has frequented the same café in Cairo every afternoon for the better part of a century. <clears throat> But Mahfouz uses this lexicon, quote, with consummate artistry, whether in recent works which deal with the fate of the Egyptian cultural intelligentsia, or in the Cairo trilogy, a series of novels about one family's vicissitudes and the triumphs uh, of their spirit from the time of the British occupation through the liberation of Egypt and beyond. It is this work that recently brought a whole world to life for me, how rare to open a book and see men and women spring from the tiny black marks, hear their voices as if in the same room, follow their stories as if one were a member of their family. And that is what happened to me. That is the triumph of Nagib Mahfouz, that I, a liberated Jewish woman on the cusp of the 21st century, could empathize with all the major characters in a Muslim country at the turn of the 20th. Not only with the women folk, from the demure wife who calls her husband Sir, and waits for him to arrive at midnight after his bacchanals, not only with the courtesans in their pleasure boats on the Nile, not only with the budding writer who is the eyes of the novel. I identify also with Ahmad Abdul Jawad himself, the tyrannical father who drives his wife from their house after 25 years of marriage. She's never gone out alone when she ventures to visit the shrine of her favorite saint. He takes her back. The father himself engages in a nightly debauch with his cronies and their courtesan. At the end of the book, I am as concerned about him as, as I am with, with, with the other characters, the huge, lust-driven son of his first marriage, with Fami, the politically sensitive brother, the darling of the family, who's crushed in a protest against the British power, and so forth and so on. How is it that Nagib Mahfouz has made me care about this pre-modern patriarch with his unlicensed taste for music and wine. The author sees to it that I understand him. If no man is a hero to his valet, no man is a villain in his own or a great novelist's eyes. In his own eyes, Ahmed Abdul Jawad, a prosperous merchant who is modern enough to have only one wife at a time, is protecting his family, including his wife, against the dangers of the world. He is bringing up his sons and daughters, as any parent tries to do, so that they will prosper within the confines of their society. If he takes his women and wine and music in great quantity, he feels that as a man he is entitled to these things, and as a deeply religious person whose Allah is quite forgiving, feels that these sins of the flesh will be overlooked as no more than mortal frailties. When he and his first son inadvertently share a woman, however, Mahfouz tweaks his father figure uh, quite mercilessly. This understanding of character is great in and of itself. 
But the story of this family also parallels the history of Egypt. Going from a very traditional society, as restrictive as the street in Palace Walk, the first volume of the trilogy, to one in which Western customs and habits liberate the individual but spell the disintegration of the family unit, a period in which the men, including our humanist hero, fall in love with a European ideal that entices them even as it betrays. The Cairo Trilogy presents us with what C.E. Bosworth claims the Arabic novel always provides us with, many penetrating insights, quotes, into aspects of contemporary Arab society in the macrocosm, the splendors and miseries of its adjustment to the larger world, and the counter-movement of its rejection and withdrawal from it. In the microcosm, the struggle of the individual against the constrictions of society, of the village, or of the family, a struggle in which the protagonist may well appear as that archetypal figure of recent Western literature, the outsider. Moreover, I see in the struggle between the ascetic and the sensual, the religious and the profane, in Ahmed Abdul Jawad's prescriptions for his family and nightly wanderings into the world of erotic love and overflowing music, the deep ambivalence in Arabic culture itself, a culture which has revered art, poetry, and the life of the senses, while at the same time limiting access to them. If I so feel for this rift in Ahmed Abdul Jawad, is it not because such a struggle is not only Egyptian, not only Arabic, not only male, but universal, and that by finding the universal in the, in the particular, the world-class novelist has arrived at the universal again? Edward Said, professor of comparative literature at Columbia University, has written that Mahfouz's career is distinguished because his work is so thoroughly Egyptian. In much the same way, Chinua Achebe's work is thoroughly African. This sense of place to these authors must not be overlooked. It is complexity of place that provides the source from which these two Nobel laureates draw their work. Thank you.